I'd like to spend the next few minutes in this homily this week hearing those promises of eternity with God through the gorgeous poem, Psalm 90. That psalm has special meaning for many of us as it is often a psalm that is read during funerals. When I was a parish pastor many years ago, we would, at the time of a funeral, gather at the entrance to the church. Casket, clergy, cross-bearer, family. We would place the white pall on the casket as a reminder of baptism, and then following the cross, we would process into the sanctuary to gather around the Eucharist. As we processed, it was often our custom that my colleague and I would read responsibly the words of Psalm 90. Every time I hear that psalm, it brings tears to my eyes. Not because there is no hope, but tears of sadness because of people I miss. <laughs> People's voices that I no longer hear. People whose witness has influenced me, but also tears of joy because it shows to us the promise of eternity and what it means for us to be with God forever. I hope that you'll take some time this week to read Psalm 90 again and to savor each of those verses and just let this beautiful psalm of hope and promise fill you and wash over you. There are really two lessons to be learned from that psalm as we read it and dwell on it. The first is teaching about our human nature. And the second is about God's eternal love. Those are big topics. Topics that have occupied philosophers and theologians, have filled books and books and bookshelves. And it's a little bit presumptuous for us to say in the next five minutes we're going to tackle those two. But when you read Psalm 90, you find out just about all you need to know. The first is about human nature when you look at Psalm 90. It's important for us to hear this message within the context of the message about God's love. The message that the psalmist talks about might sound harsh and hopeless if we didn't have the second message, but like excellent and inspired poetry, the psalmist tells it like it is. We humans go back to dust. The psalmist says, there it is, stark and without apology. This is our destiny and not something we want much to admit or truth we want to face. But like the psalmist says, we humans, our lives are like a dream. You know how we all want to be remembered and so we place markers on graves and plates at receptacles for ashes, but most of us aren't going to be remembered for a long time. Maybe the kids and the grandkids and the great-grandkids, and then they'll start to tell apocryphal stories about us, and then pretty soon we're not going to be a part of the story. We are, the psalmist says, like grass that is strong and growing and nurtured by the rain, but one day it fades and it withers. Then perhaps the most stark of those words for people like me are that our days are 70 years in number. Three score year and 10, you might remember if you learned it in the King James Version. Maybe even 80, the psalmist says, but eventually, eventually, we'll all be gone. And we'll be with those who have gone before us. But interspersed with those seemingly harsh words about our human nature, the psalmist inserts what we believe about God. Lord, the psalmist begins, you have been our dwelling place from one generation to another. Even before the mountains were formed, you are God. I have such deep admiration for the work of physicists who study our universe. 
I'm not one of them, and I often get confused and quite flummoxed when I read their work, that the universe is expanding, the discovery of solar systems that may have planets in it that can support life, it's beyond my comprehension. I don't understand the distances between solar systems. I just don't understand. I can't comprehend it, but what I can comprehend is that, God, you have been our dwelling place from one generation to another. Before the mountains or hills in order stood, you are God. Maybe if the psalmist lived in this age, the psalmist would say, before we knew the universe was expanding, we would say that you are God. God, you speak the truth to us. We are not you, as much as we all might like to be. We are not you, we are creatures, sinners, and our lives are full of iniquities, and our days are over, but the truth is, we are never without God's presence. One of the great gifts you have at St. Mark's Church, and in many of our churches, is that you have a parish cemetery where those who have gone before you are at rest. It's a chance for people to go and see the names on gravestones and be reminded that no matter what trials we face today, those folks also face trials, temptations, worries, hurts, wonders, and yet their faith sustained them because God has been our God from one generation to another. So dear, dear God, teach us to number our days so that we can chalk them up to anything other than applying our hearts to wisdom. Make us glad, as only you can, especially when it's difficult to be glad. And we pray that God will prosper the work of our hands. Perhaps Jesus had this psalm in mind when he told the parable today about the various talents that people have been given and the judgment on the one who did not use the gifts that had been given him. It's a message that Jesus has brought to this earth in human form and compassion. And God help us must be the message that we Jesus followers cling to and share with anyone who will hear. So listen again to those two sentences. Be comforted by them. Be encouraged by them. Read Psalm 90 this week. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him, and from the parable, enter into the joy of your master. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Lord of the church, ignite your people with the passion of your love. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, unify us across ministries, congregations, and denominations, and refine us to participate in your activity throughout the world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of the nations, sound forth your justice in the ears of all leaders. Increase concern for those who are most vulnerable, especially as international leaders forge trade agreements and cooperate to end human rights abuses. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of all in need, search out all who cry to you in distress. Scatter the heavy clouds of depression, chronic illness, unemployment, and loneliness with your radiant light. Send us as encouragement and signs of your healing. Be with those for whom we now pray before you, aloud or silently. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of the living and the dead, we give you thanks for all saints at rest from their labors. Rouse us to live by their example that saints yet to come may know your love. Hear us, O God, 
your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all your creation around your throne, where you reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.